I know are already pretty well known to most of you, I think bring something to these discussions that perhaps has been missing in some debates about Boko Haram, and that in particular is some really in-depth field work that each of the three have conducted uh, in northern Nigeria over the last year or two. Uh, the kind of research that involves firstly getting quite close to Boko Haram and actually interviewing uh, a lot of members um, of the insurgency, so trying to understand Boko Haram from the inside, uh, but also engaging very closely with affected populations and with the Nigerian state. So you're going to hear, I think, in their presentations, a reflection of this very wide, this very deep field work that, that each of them uh, have done. And as a result of that, I think they're going to tackle different dimensions of Boko Haram from what we often hear, and also give us more of an insight into the responses to Boko Haram than perhaps has, has been in many of the discussions uh, to date. What I'm going to do is introduce uh, all three of them up front, and then one by one they're going to come up and, and give us their different takes on, on the Boko Haram situation. We're first going to hear from, from Atta Bakindo, um, who's a PhD uh, student in politics uh, at SOAS. He has the misfortune, just like Ini and Bala, to be supervised by me. So despite that level of supervision, they are actually fantastic and have produced really fantastic work. Um, Bakindo is also, apart from his work at SOAS, a research fellow at the Global Initiative on Civil Society and Conflict, which is at the University of South Florida. He's also a technical consultant to the EU's big program on de-radicalization in northern Nigeria, which I'm sure he'll talk about a bit more in just a moment. Uh, this evening, he's going to be focusing particularly on, on these themes of, of reconciliation and de-radicalization. Secondly, we'll hear from, from Ini Deli Adebeji, also a PhD candidate at SOAS. He's a former youth worker uh, from Lagos. His research focuses on the construction of Islamic identities in northern Nigeria and how they function as vehicles of mobilisation for Boko Haram. This evening, he's going to focus mainly on issues of, of religion and the role of Islamic scholars in, in uh, redressing many of the harms uh, committed by the insurgency. And finally, we're going to hear from, from Bala Liman, also from SOAS. Uh, his research focuses mainly on the nexus between conflict and identity in northern Nigeria and issues of poverty and inequality. This evening, he's going to talk especially about social inequality in the northeastern states uh, of Nigeria and what socioeconomic uh, and development responses to Boko Haram uh, would look like. Each of them are going to speak for uh, about 15 minutes. I'm going to be pretty strict on the time, um, but you guys are highly disciplined, so there'll be no issues there, I'm sure. That'll then leave us with plenty of time for question uh, and answer. The final thing I should say by way of introduction is that we are videoing the whole event. Uh, so bear that in mind when you ask your incendiary uh, and provocative questions uh, in the Q&A. We are filming this because we know that there's an audience who couldn't be here this evening that's also interested in the discussion. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Barkindo, who's actually got a video um, that he's going to show to kind of set this evening's event up, and then he'll uh, give us his presentation. Thanks very much. So the, the video I'm going to show is not part of my 15 minutes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's to give a general introduction so that you can see how the Northeast looks like, how the people there look like, how they talk, so that, so that you get to see. And I think that when you have these visual images of how these places look like, when we begin to talk, you can now understand the context from which we are talking. So we are going to begin with the
capital now plays host to hundreds of thousands of internally displaced persons whose homes, businesses and other means of livelihood have been destroyed by Boko Haram. The reason why Yola is the most preferred destination for the internally displaced persons is simple. Yola is supposed to be more safe and secure since it is the seat of power of the Adamao state government. Some of the internally displaced persons are from the northern part of Adamawa, particularly Mobi, Michika, Madagali, Maiha and Hang local government areas, while others are from neighboring Borno state, the epicenter of the insurgency. There is no doubt that these internally displaced persons are people devastated. However, some among them demonstrate that they are indeed global citizens. Kelo Apagu, a mother of seven from Dagu village in Askira Uba local government of Borno state, while fleeing from Boko Haram attack in Lhasa, found a boy of three years between Lhasa and Delay. She heard a child crying under some shrubs when she was approaching a stream for a drink of water after trekking for hours. She carried the baby, marched on in the company of her children till she reached Yola. Gloria Kuhu, an official of the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, makes this confirmation. So we now ask her, is she going to keep the child with her or we should take the child to the orphanage home? She now said no, she's going to keep the child with her since it is God that has given her the child. We now said okay. The child got used to her, he just took her as his mom. If she leaves him and maybe trying to do something, he will be crying and be following her around. In a related development, Mariam Buwa from Gulag is always nursing and nurturing a child she also had to surrogate despite religious and ethnic differences. <laughs> Mariam also found Chinda Wulia in the bush while fleeing Boko Haram in Gulag area of Adamao state. Although parents of Chinda have discovered that the young boy now lives with his surrogate mother, the bond between them is such that no one can now separate them. It was reliably gathered that Mariam and Chinda, who was in pre-nursery school, had an accident while fleeing from Boko Haram. For 28-year-old Lamy Joseph, apart from spending as much as 15,000 naira, an equivalent of $93.8, transporting the sick and aged away from Madagali town when Boko Haram struck, she also took with her eight children of her kith and kin to relatively save Yola before parents of the children came and took them away. <laughs> While in Gombe, on her way to Yola, an evil man from southeast Nigeria could not believe that one person could carry as much as eight children. Moved by this gesture, he bought the children some clothing as well as food. Muhammad Baza, a Muslim with 11 children and three wives, now plays host to 21 internally displaced persons, among them four Muslims and 17 Christians. Allah, 
He believes that any religion worth its name does not segregate, kill, or teach violence. The coordinator of Justice, Peace, and Development Commission of the Catholic Diocese of Yula, Reverend Father Maurice Kwaranga, also points out that religion should not be a reason for discrimination, particularly when it comes to life threatening issues. The reason why we, the Catholic Diocese of Yola, under the Office of the Justice and Peace Commission, we are called upon to attend to the challenge of uh, addressing the needs of the displaced people. When they came into our place here, when Baza Michika were overrun, uh, precisely on the 15th of September, uh, people came in here to the gate looking for food and shelter. So we are forced to take them in and make provision for them. Demonstrating the willingness to help beyond the walls of religion and ethnicity was what made Mayra Mabature, a mother of five, to sell her clothes to help transport people away from the danger zone of Michika when Boko Haram attacked. She bought the clothes for 3,500 Naira an equivalent of $21.8, but sold it for only 1,000 Naira, equivalent to $6.5, just to save lives. As Father Morris hinted, the greatest challenge now is that of building a post-conflict society. Already, Reverend Sister Catherine Hannan, the initiator and director of the adult literacy program in rural Jabe, a suburb of Yula, is bringing both Muslims and Christians together not just to make them literate and numerate, but to make them learn how to live in peace and harmony. In my experience, if people organize themselves, not alone will they be shut down, but the service bodies will come offering their services to know what they can do. So really, and at the moment, the biggest challenge is, say for the NGO, the people are interested, but now they need a little coaching just to get off the ground, but there's nobody to coach them. There's nobody there to watch that. Suleiman Halidu says that adult education is a commendable program, but regrets that the fear of attack by Boko Haram, even in Yola, is making people leave Yola for safer towns across the country. No one gives them this education pertaining Hausa and also the English. And we have some another part, we have computer, interest, and also the keyboard. And we have even the three distribution. Been doing it here on behalf of sister. Since 2009, we have had massive, massive insurgency in this country. Killings, destruction by Boko Haram, families to families, towns and towns, villages have been completely destroyed by Boko Haram. And the biggest challenge before the Nigerian government is how to overcome this division that has been created by the Boko Haram insurgency, particularly for the internally displaced people because these people have left behind their families and their homes. So the problem now is, if these people get back home, how will they collaborate with those that they have left behind? How will they live together with those that they have left behind in collaborating with Boko Haram in order to destroy their homes? So the biggest challenge for the Nigerian government is to come up with a specific post-conflict reconstruction strategy. A strategy that is able to unite its people, a strategy that is able to bring about reconciliation in the society, a strategy that is able to ensure these people are able to live together in peace. And I think in a very simple and ordinary way, that strategy has begun here and now. Where we can see together Christians and Muslims coming to learn in order to empower themselves to participate effectively in the Nigerian economy. And I think bit by bit, small by small, that is the way we can eventually overcome the problems of the insurgency and begin to reconstruct and to rebuild our country, our society, and our nation. We hope and with our vibrant faith in God that one day Nigeria will reach that stage. And we hope that the Nigerian government is listening and listening well.
So you know that Boko Haram has been demonized for a very, very long time. And a lot of people have tried to say so many things about Boko Haram. But as Bishop Kuka would say in Nigeria, even the devil needs to be understood in order to be conquered or to be avoided. So I will just briefly try to reconstruct the ideology of Boko Haram, not so much from what journalists have reported, what other Islamic scholars have said, but practically from what Boko Haram members themselves, those that I was able to get in contact, particularly the defected members that I met throughout my field work at the military checkpoints or working with local hunters or the civilian JTF, and also from their YouTube videos that have been in existence since 1995. What do they really say? Because a lot of people have assumed this is what Bo Haram said, but I've tried to translate most of these YouTube videos. Now look at the impact of the atrocities on local communities, and I'll then make my own suggestion regarding approaches to reconciliation and reconstruction. Looking at the ideology of Boko Haram, First of all, I just want us to look at Boko Haram. Of course, Haram, we all know, almost the halal, something you know that is permissible. Halal is permissible, and Haram is forbidden. It's not only forbidden, but it's simple. <coughs> just like Yusuf al Qadrawi, the famous sheikh in Egypt, will tell us, Haram is not only forbidden, but forbidden by Allah Himself. And then once something is forbidden, it's forbidden, no matter how good the intention is, and even honorable the intention is. So that is certain. But if you look at Boko, they have been translating Boko as book, or education, or civilization. But Boko is a house of word that has been in use even before Western civilization probably came to Nigeria. So how would you have used something that was not even in existence? <coughs> and that's why I try to look at deeply the meaning of Boko. If you look at the first house dictionary by this um, George Bagley in 1934, about seven meanings of Boko are given, and all these seven meanings were related to the word fraud. Something that is fake is counterfeit. So in Northern Nigeria, education is generally, I'm not an expert in house language, but it's generally seen as ilimi. And that is why there's always a distinction in Northern Nigeria about the ilimi Islamia, which is Islamic education. And it teaches about Islam, the Quran, Arabic, paradise, all the good values that the Islamic religion will access to. But Ilimi Boko is education that does not teach about Islam. So any other form of education that does not teach about Islam is considered Ilimi Boko. And that is considered fake. It's fraudulent. It's counterfeit. It's a deceit. So it's not necessarily just Western education. It could include even African traditional witchcraft or any other thing that does not teach you know, about about um, Islam. So that is why Umar Sali, the leader of Boko Haram, who immediately took over when Yusuf was killed, before Sheikhau came on, he simply not only denied the name Boko Haram, but he tried to insist that they should be called Jamaatul Ahl Sunnah and Dawah Wal Jihad. And there he is not only trying to promote the superiority of the Islamic religion and culture, but to show that they are a group that will simply and strictly Follow what is stated in the Quran and the life of the Prophet, you know, himself. So that's why he insisted on the name Jamaatul Ahl Sunnah Mil Dawati Wal Jihad. And I think that that comes from, you know, I'm not an expert in Islamic theology. I really have to confess that. But a little reading will show that it comes from all this Salafi kind of ideology that is very, very much in existence. And you know, Salafism refers to the pious predecessors, the ancestors. And they believe that temporal proximity to the Prophet is the truest form of Islam. So they call on Muslims to return to this original form as much as possible as it was practiced, you know, by the Prophet himself. And how to return to that original form of Islam has given rise to various forms of Salafist groups. So you have like the, Sal the, the Salafi purists who claim that you have to depend on the Quran and the Sunnah, but it's more about more what we call the tarbiya, education for the purification of the soul, or the tasfiya. Or you have the Salafi activists. They, they depend on the Quran and the Sunnah, but they also believe in participating in political process. And then you have the Salafi jihadists. They believe both in the Quran and the Sunnah, but the jihad becomes what they call the manhaj, or the methodology 
for establishing the Dawlan Islamia, the Islamic State. And therefore, it is generally agreed that Boko Haram belongs to that kind of ultra Salafi jihadi group that not only believes in strict you know, adherence to the Quran and the life of the Prophet, but they also believe in the use of jihad as a method for establishing the Islamic State. And so, what Yusuf did was, first of all, he wrote this book. This is our creed and the methodology of our preaching. And in it, he deeply depended on the Quran and the Sunnah, which means the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, and the Sila, the actions of the Prophet. And that's why if you read that, if you have a copy of that book, just read it. The first line will be, our religion is Islam. Our creed is the creed of Muhammad and his companions. Our minha, that is our methodology, is jihad. We believe that the Sharia is the only truth. The Constitution is a lie. That's the Nigerian Constitution, and probably any other secular Constitution. It is kufar. Democracy is a lie. It is kufar. Working with the secular government is a lie. It is kufar. Working with security agencies is a lie. It is kufar. And even Sheikh Khaled himself, in one of the videos, he said, whatever is clear in the Quran, just implement it. You don't need the commentaries of theologians or scholars. Whatever is clear, implement it. If something is not clear in the Quran, look at the life of the Prophet. Copy from the life of the Prophet. And therefore, anything that does not conform to the Quran and the Sunnah, reject it completely. It must be rejected. And if it means using violence, they do it. That's what Sheikh Al said. And therefore, if you look at that, I just selected like three aspects from which they are able to try to implement that kind of ideology. I selected Western education, and I selected Western democracy and globalization. So I'll briefly talk on the three. For the Western education is not only fake and deceitful, it is also dangerous. First of all, they believe that Western education and scientific research deliberately destroy the teachings, the literal teachings of the Quran. For example, Yusuf, in one of the videos, and I'm quoting directly, he talks about the Big Bang Theory. And he talks about the universe was created about 1 billion, 600 million, 3 minutes and 1 second years ago. And that contradicts Quran 5038. We created the heavens and the earth, and between them in six days. So if Western education teaches you the Big Bang Theory, and the Quran says a different thing, as a Muslim, you have to reject what the Western education teaches and accept that of the Quran. And they also talk about the Western education promotes corruption and sexual permissiveness. And Yusuf talks about Nigerian politicians rule us using certificates from Western institutions. But look at the level of corruption and immorality among the politicians. Is that what Western education should give us? Sheikh Al talks about we cannot allow this problem Western education to destroy Islam. I will fight it with my blood. So the third aspect is that Western education, they believe, is a conspiracy to maintain this neo-colonial hegemony over you know, Muslim countries. And that's why Yusuf translated this book, Global Foreign and Colonialist Schools, Their History and Dangers, is written by Abdullah Zaid who is a very prominent Wahhabi scholar you know, in Saudi Arabia. And he used to also wrote this book, al Maiduguria. And in all that, he tries to show that the Western education you know, is, is a Western conspiracy to dominate Muslims, and therefore it should be rejected. And so Shekhar himself says, followers of Western education have usurped our heart to the philosophy that is contrary to the demands of Allah. They have imposed upon us laws that are not of Allah, and therefore we must reject that. They also talk about the rejection of democracy, and there are so many quotations from the Quran, but I just pick up one. They talk about Quran 544. Whoever does not judge, and judge here is not like a judge in the courtroom, you know, that is not. Whoever does not rule the affairs of men, which is politics, Anyone who does not rule according to the Quran, then that person is an infidel or they are infidel. So they believe that human beings must individually and collectively surrender all rights of exercising authority and making laws completely over to Allah. 
I met one of the members of Boko Haram at the military checkpoint who claimed to have been defected. He told me, not even President Jonathan has the right to make laws in Nigeria. Allah alone is the real lawgiver, and democracy is the rejection of Allah's authority. Yusuf denounced the concept of Darura the necessity that for because they believe that for the Muslims, we can accept to live under an un-Islamic government if the possibility of turning the whole place into Sharia law is not possible. You can simply accept it because it's necessary for the common good. That kind of thinking, Yusuf say, it should not be accepted. We have to do everything we can to ensure that Sharia rules in that place. So they insist that three elements of Western democracy must be destroyed. The first is the secular identity of the state. Constitution, national anthem, the pledge, the flag. And that's why Sheikh Al says, we will ensure that they do not say, I pledge to Nigeria, my country, but I pledge to Allah, my God. And they also say, multi party democracy must be rejected. Sheikh Al says, it's no longer going to be government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but government of Allah, by Allah, and for Allah. And the third aspect is this issue of separating state and religion. They say they wouldn't accept that. And therefore, they use the Quranic concept of the tagu, ungodly rulers. And wherever they are found, they should be gotten rid of. And so Nigerian politicians, whether they are Christians or Muslims, they are ungodly rulers. And therefore, they should be replaced with Sharia. They also develop what we call the anti-globalization ideology on the basis of tawhid. Tawhid is the uniqueness, the unicity, the oneness of Allah. And they say this oneness is at two levels. That Allah is the only supreme being. And as the only supreme being, he has rights. He's the only one who can create. He's the only one who can be worshipped. He is the only one who can be called king and powerful. But what has globalization done? They understood globalization to be at two levels. As an ideology and as a structure. As an ideology, globalization is a Western conspiracy to unite the whole world under one single civilization. That is a Western civilization, which means the Islamic civilization is going to be destroyed. And Sheikhau calls this the new world order, which is not going to be accepted. And he says that globalization has created global institutions like the UN and NATO. And these institutions have won, you saw the authority of Allah, they have excluded Allah from the affairs of men. They have enacted human laws that propagate political systems that exploit Muslim nations and negate the Quran. And therefore, globalization has structures, road networks, information technology, and banks. Sheikhau says we will use these structures of globalization to fight globalization. He refers to the United Nations in Hausa as Majalis are thinking is country a united parliament for immorality, which is not going to be accepted. And in fact, Sheikhau says, Jonathan, Obama, Ban Ki-moon, you allow gay marriage, lesbian relationships, calling them human rights. If it is your right to do what is wrong, it is also our right to stop what is wrong and ensure that the commands of Allah reign supreme. So these are the kind of ideologies you know, they propagate. So if they propagate these ideologies, what Yusuf has done is to localize them at the beginning, to call for Islamic State, rejection of Western democracy, education, corruption within the Nigerian society, military brutality, and call for the reform of Islamic character. But Sheikhau declared total jihad, collaboration with other global jihad organizations, and takfirism, assuming the authority to declare other Muslims as infidels simply because they do not accept their own brand, you know, of Islam. And you know the atrocities are well known to you. I'm showing this picture because this is like, I traveled like from Bombay right up to Banki, near Cameroon. This is almost like most of the areas they were controlled by Boko Haram under the Caliphate. You can see right up to Chad and Niger and parts of Cameroon. And especially if you go to a place called Amichere in Cameroon, Thousands of Boko Haram fighters, you know, are also from that place. And what are the effects on the social and community relationships? What Boko Haram done is to carry out selective killings and what they refer to as takfirism, declaring other Muslims who don't agree with them, you know, as infidels. 
So when they go to a place that are Christian non-Muslim institutions that are targeted, like schools and hospitals and churches, but they also target Muslim non-Boko Haram members who are considered as collaborators. They target even their schools and their moms. I met a woman in a movie who told me, my husband was beheaded because he rented out part of the apartment to a Christian family. So they are Muslims, but Boko Haram killed them because they refused not only to be part of Boko Haram and to believe in what Boko Haram is doing, but because they rented out part of their apartment to a Christian. And as far as they are concerned, these guys are collaborators. I've also looked at letters that Boko Haram has written to Kanuri soldiers, warning them not to fight for the Nigerian government, but to leave the Nigerian government and then come over and join them. And sometimes, when a village is being attacked by Boko Haram and some people leave, other people remain. Some of these people who remain and collaborate with Boko Haram to destroy places, I do not believe necessarily that they have the ideological intention, probably, but I'm not to judge. But what happens is that when they remain, they are able to tell Boko Haram which house belongs to a Christian, which farm belongs to a Christian, which shop belongs to a Christian. So my worry is that if Christians begin to return and people begin to return and see the level of destruction, how are they going to live together? And that's why most of the IDP camps I visited, you, it will be shocking to you to discover that even within the camps, people cannot trust each other. People do not trust each other. They live either according to their towns, either according to their religious affiliation. They, even some of the, the camps, you will find camps for Muslims and then camps for Christians. So how are we going to handle that in the context of Nigeria? What, are we, what is going to be the approach that the new government particularly will take? I'm aware of all these academic debates, you know, about minimalist approaches regarding negotiations or the maximal regarding prosecutions or whether the moderate approach. I don't want to go too academic because the reality on ground in Nigeria is actually very, very different. So for me, the new government or any other government at all should consider what I call first the immediate approach. What are the immediate things that are needed to be done? The first one I would suggest is that of demobilizing all these local hunters, ethnic militias, vigilante groups, and civilian JTF. Because as people are prepared to return back to the territories that have been retaken, they are going to see a level of destruction they have not seen before. How are they going to cope? And if you have ethnic groups already armed, are they going to go for revenge killings and reprisal killings? And the other one will be engaging traditional rulers, opening up channels of you know, engagements and communication. And if there are people who are suspected to have collaborated with Boko Haram, is it possible for them to own up and to meet their victims and to ask for forgiveness? If it means sitting under the tree, you know, talking to each other, open up channels of communication, just at the local level, supported by the government, and led by the traditional rulers and some of the religious scholars and religious you know, teachers that are available. For me, I think this is very, very important. Otherwise, if we just allow the thing to go on like that, it could generate another set of conflict that we never thought of. And the other aspect will be that the government must recognize that apart from Boko Haram, there are other existing you know, Islamic sects that they should be watched and they should be monitored, and if possible, constantly evaluated, like the Kalakato, the Aljana Tapas, I met some of them in Gombe, the al Qur'an the Darul Islam, the Medina to Kefi, and the Hakika group. All these groups are existing, and sometimes they espouse very intolerant views, just like the way Boko Haram started at the beginning. But just like before, maybe, you know, if the government doesn't pay attention, you know, these groups could also become a problem. And there should be immediate reconstruction of schools, bridges, roads, provision of security in retaking territories, the activation of unexploded bombs. But I'm even more concerned regarding the issue of education for young, young people and children that have been orphaned by the Boko Haram conflict. And there must be regional cooperation, serious one between Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, Chad, particularly at this border region, on issues of environment and security. And the final aspect is what I call the long-term solution. I think my friends will talk about probably the economic reconstruction and reformation of the military and security institution. But I just want to talk briefly on the federal government project that I'm involved on. 
which is called countering violent extremism. There are three components to this project. There's the counter radicalization, providing economic benefits, employment, young people, so that they are not being radicalized, you know, by radical groups like Boko Haram. And that's what we call the strategic communication. And this is about trying to counter the narratives of Boko Haram either on internet, on the media, and other social kind of uh, channels. But the aspect, the very aspect I'm involved in is what is called the de-radicalization. The de-radicalization deals with Boko Haram members who are already in custody, and thousands are being brought in almost every day by the military. Nigerian prisons, some of them are really overflowing. The government really doesn't know what to do with these people. One day these people may have to be sent back into the society. Some have already been convicted, others are awaiting trial, others have just been brought in. And you know that at the moment there is really no research to demonstrate to us who actually is a member of Boko Haram. How many of these people are actually members of Boko Haram? So when these guys are being brought to the prison, the first thing they do is classification. And we discover that some are simply opportunists, others are sympathizers, others are simply followers, others are the hardcore ideologues. So the, what the, the, the government tries to do is to separate these people into groups and they construct the prisons in such a way that they don't mingle and the prison doesn't become a further environment for further radicalization you know, of these guys. So they are separated and there are support psychologists, there are mental health experts, there are religious scholars, and there are educators. So the government now is trying to see and to see how if somebody happens just to be an opportunist, how do we radicalize him and send him back into the society? and really empower him to participate effectively in the Nigerian economy. So the final thing I would say here is that the government must avoid certain mistakes that were done in the past. The first one is that Boko Haram is not a rat tag drenched kind of sect, a poverty, poverty streaming group of people. They are really, really well organized, and the government must really take them very, very seriously. And I think that Nigeria, and even the, the international community, must not see Boko Haram as simply a Nigerian problem. I think it's beyond that at the moment. It's really almost a regional, if not an international problem. So there must be stronger regional cooperation between Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon with the support of the international community. Now in the past, if you look at since Nigeria's independence, from the Nigeria civil war to Maitasine to military dictatorship, most of our problems and conflicts are really internally generated, in my opinion. It's not as if Cameroon is coming to invade Nigeria or Russia is coming to invade Nigeria. Most of our problems are internally generated, and we have not been able to deal with that. And each time there's an outbreak of crisis, the government will set up a committee of inquiry. The members of the committee will get their allowances, pocket it. And when there's next crisis, another committee of inquiry is set up and they reproduce exactly the same solutions that the other committee reproduce, and then they simply, you know, pocket. There is no committee of reconciliation. It is always a committee of, you know, inquiry. And most of the, the, the reports are never, never implemented. A very good example is the Obasanjo's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When the report was published, it was never published, it was never implemented, and nothing happened, and life continued as normal. And I think Buhari, has this time around with Boko Haram to really, really do something different. So thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks, Dr. Kinde. Um, in the meantime, I do apologize too for the very strange lighting here. Every button I pushed seemed to threaten to create another problem. So I'm gonna kind of leave it as it is, and hopefully uh, we won't all be plunged into darkness. Um, over to you, Guinea. thanks.
And so I just uh, jump into it. The first I've titled History and Role of the Nigerian Government's Interaction with Movements Such as Boko Haram. The government of Muhammadu Buhari used brute force in crushing the riots caused in Kano in the 70s by a millenarian heterodox Islamic sect known as the Yantatsinu. In the aftermath of the violence in which thousands of lives were lost, the government set up the Anyagolu Commission along with another body of inquiry by the Kano state government under Abubakar Rimi to find out the cause of the revolt. But the government never set up a committee to work on reconciliation or reconstruction, more so as most of the victims of the wanton, vi uh, the wanton killing unleashed in Kano by the Yantatsinu sect had been civilians. The findings and reports of the Anyagolu Commission which looked at the socio-economic causes of the revolt by this sect and how it was used within a religious context were disregarded by the government. Even within the, the history of panels, committees and commissions which have been set up in Nigeria's post-independence history, there's been a lack of efficacy due to the disrespect shown to these commissions which were seen as being merely ceremonial or lacking in legitimacy. This serves to limit their effects. Ironically enough, Buhari was summoned before the Uputa panel but refused to attend. With this tradition and lack of history of compliance with these commissions, unlike in other places such as Rwanda and South Africa where they've experienced a great amount of success, it's going to be a huge task to give any prospective truth and reconciliation committee the requisite legitimacy it needs to be effective within the Nigerian populace. Prior to the entry of Boko Haram, militant movements had existed in Nigeria, some as cults, use the split, uh, or some use as cults, some as political thugs, some as vigilante groups, all filling the security vacuum, and then others championing ethnic causes, such as the Duas People Co uh, Congress, known as uh, the popular called the OPC, and then uh, in the north, the Arawa People's Congress, called uh, the APC, which was um, more for the, the House of Fulani. The commonality between these groups was that they served certain socio-economic functions, they provided certain services and filled certain vacuums. So in the case of the OPC, they purported to pr protect the, the interest of the Yoruba people in the aftermath of June 12, 1993, particularly against what they felt was the domination of the House of Fulani, especially at the local levels in, par in parts of the southern region. Then the Arawa People's Congress, the APC, was militarized reflexively to show that they could match the OPC. The OPC then mutated into a vigilante group to address the spate of armed robberies and crimes and became judge, jury, and executioners in many instances, literally. These are all themes which can be found within Boko Haram's provenance and growth at various levels. In the East, you also have the Bakasi boys who rose to infamy at a time in the late 90s when highway robbery, particularly of the highly patronized coaches flying the roads to the Eastern region, had become a frequently abhorrent pattern, along with other vagaries like abductions and other petty crimes. They as well were recognized as a, as a necessity and given legitimacy by local communities and tacitly also by the local security agencies. The crux of that preamble is that there's always been a huge vacuum of accountability and of security within Nigeria, Nigeria historically. To an extent, Boko Haram's transmogrification has been due to these two factors. When Boko Haram began to be courted by politicians, especially within the Borno ANPP, with Ali Modu Sharif as head honcho, Mohamed Yusuf began to see a way through which his ideas about creating a Sharia state in northern Nigeria could be achieved without the, the, the stress created through the use of maximum force. It was not so much that he was averse to the use of force, I should point out, Contrary to what many derivative reports have come out with, he was prepared for the use of eventual force, but did not see it as an initial resort. This is why he had the men in the sect trading the use of weapons, ammunition and weapons, which were stockpiled at the sect commune in railway quarters and some of their other cells prior to 2009. Railway quarters was the place where they, most of them lived as a, as a community. He began to reach out to drug adult youth 
miscreants and prisoners through his Dawa missionaries, ostensibly to save them since the government wouldn't do so. And uh, this alienated some of his earlier followers who felt that the new members had begun to dilute the sect and were already <coughs> causing a diversion from the, the early teachers of their leader, which had led them to, uh, to join in the first place. I mentioned this to create notions and assertions about the homogenous structure of the sect to show that there have been fractures, some of which are evident now, that existed even prior to 2009. Seeking an entry point into the realm of politics and evasive influences in Borno State as part of the eventual goal of carving out a purist Islamic state, Yusuf joined forces with Ali Modu Sheriff, who already controlled another youth, youth group known as Ekomog, and mobilized youth within his sect, which at this time was already brimming with many members, from early members to those recruited by the Dawa missionaries. The Dawa missionaries were the, the early followers of Muhammad Yusuf, they were the ones he taught directly, face to face, the, a, a purer version of Bokram's ideology. They offered their support to the AMPP and terrorized those who were not supportive of the AMPP, mostly engaging political thugs of the other opposing parties in violent conflict. In the brief period in which this union between Bokram or Yusufia, as they were mostly called then in my degree, and Sharif's own gang, Ekmog, lasted, they were able to achieve some change in the religious setup of the state, although it didn't last very long. Some might say this was due to Yusuf's uh, political naivete, while others might say it was due to the fact that Sheriff was a, a disingenuous politician who promised to give Yusuf Kablog, but then reneged on his promises. I would presume to say that it was a bit of both. Until the last few days before his death, Yusuf kept telling his friends who I spoke with that only Sheriff could avert the fitina uh, that, that just means uh, chaos, which was about to be visited on Bordeaux. He insisted that the, the only way he would reverse this decision to create fitna in Bordeaux state was, was, was if Sharif agreed to a meeting with him personally, insisting that Sharif had promised him something and reneged on it. Many theories abound as to what exactly this thing was, which had, had him so incensed, but I was unable to find out what it was from speaking with his uh, confidants. What I'm driving at is that there are still many actors within this grand narrative of the, the Boko Haram behemoth who are alive and have to be held accountable or answer questions in any prospective post Boko Haram reconstruction and reconciliation committee or commission to be set up. One unassailable fact evident to all, try as he might to deny the allegations of complicity against him, is that Ali Madhu Sheriff, the former governor of Borneo State, did hand over the overseen of religious affairs to Boko Haram for the brief period of their political marriage. Alaji Bujifoy, a devout Muslim and former local government chairman of Kaga Ward, who was one of the well-to-do supporters of Muhammad Yusuf and also was the sex national secretary, was chosen by Yusuf to head the Borneo State Military, uh, I beg your pardon, Ministry of Reli Religious Affairs, created specially to placate and accommodate followers of Yusuf and this led to an influx of Boko Haram members into the religious structure of, Bono, of the Borneo state government. The failure of this brief partnership between the sect and Sherry's ANPP led government, though he strenuously denies having any link with the sect today, which led to the resignation of Boko Haram members en masse from their positions within the government, led by Bujifoy, provided them with further vindication that there's no salvation for the government of Nigeria except through force. And this was reiterated after supposedly secret negotiations between the sect and the government broke down in 2004 last year with Dr. Ahmad Dati, who had been leading the negotiations up to that point, backing out. Now, the next uh, rubric I've titled, what measures, well, it's more of a question. Uh, I'm asking, what measures can the government take to ensure that the Boko Haram tragedy does not repeat itself in future? The first I, 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 I've, uh, I've written down is uh, bridging the gap between the government at the state and local levels and communities. Overhaul of government at the federal, state and local level to address some of the issues and grievances which groups like Boko Haram tap into to gain legitimacy and for mobilization at the local level. Then the, the next point I've um, written down is, uh, and this also, uh, also uh, is a preamble with a question. I'm asking, what do you do with the remnants of Boko Haram? 
The success behind many of their initial attacks was due to their familiarity with the areas they targeted. Many of their members attacked their own communities, which shows a deep sense of disconnection from society. One particular widow I spoke to in my degree told me of her son, a stepson's gradual separation from their family until he eventually signed up as a foot soldier for Boko Haram. One of his victims, before he himself was killed by the Nigerian military, was his own brother, Baraka, and his father died from a heart attack from being overwhelmed with the, the whole calamitous procession of events. As such, this begs a number of questions. How do you reconcile the members of the sect who will be released from prison at some point with their families, communities, and how do you give them a sense of belonging within society? Also, how do you reconcile them with the families of those they killed? Can there be reconciliation or reconstruction without accountability? I, I remember another, another really young man I, I, I spoke to who said to me that his own particular role within the sect after he was indoctrinated and initiated officially into the sect was that he was to act just specifically as a sporter. He had no other job but, um, um, beyond that. So his own job was to sort of, because he was, he was around 13 at the time when he joined, his own job was to just go follow around particular people who had been marked out for, for killing or, uh, or, or for some um, level of violence. And he would follow them, find out their movement, find out who their um, family members were, and then report back to the, the leader of the, the particular uh, cell group where they met, where, where they met up. Boko Haram's genesis finds its roots in the long history of othering, of what, what I call othering, which pervades the Nigerian contraption and has continued through the years of post-independence and, and has been fostered by radical preachers without interference by the government or a coalition of credible Islamic scholars to provide strong counter-narratives to them. Also, there's a, there's a wide gap in northern Nigeria between the rich and the poor. The, mid, the middle class is thin, and that gap is commensurate with the gap between those in government, their cronies, and those who live on the periphery. I'll be more specific and look at Borno State, in which the richest people in the state are, are either relatives of Mohamed Indini, one of the richest men in Africa, according to the Forbes list, and who the, the famous Mohamed Indini Mosque, where the core of Boko Haram's family members worship before their later expulsion. And that um, particular mosque is called Mohamed Indini Mosque. Or they happen to be politician or connected to the, the Sarauta. The Sarauta is a traditional ruling class in northern Nigeria. Going by the checkered history of colonial northern Nigeria, where the British favored those from the ruling families to be the beneficiaries of secular education, it has, it has since proven relatively easy for this to be used in creating a dichotomy of sorts, as we see in the case of Boko Haram, where the undesirables are Christians, the government, government workers, uh, schools teaching secular subjects, pupils who subscribe to these schools, and Muslims who disagree with Boko Haram's provincial amenitic. Any attempt at post-conflict recon reconstruction and reconciliation which hopes to move beyond lip service has to recognize this dichotomy and work towards breaking down those barriers. Now, the fourth, the, my, my, my fourth point struck suggestion is a rejigging of the intelligence agencies and reversal of the politicization of these bodies and the military. One of the many accusations leveled against the Nigerian military is that the, prosecu the, the prosecution of the battle against Boko Haram has left much to be, des to be desired, with accusations of mismanagement of funds, diversion of the security budget by the top brass, and delegation of positions based on political affiliations and the practice of what is known in Nigeria as federal character, which ostensibly is meant to accommodate and represent the ethnic diversity of Nigeria within the different arms of government and the civil service. However, the, prosecu the prosecution of the battle against Boko Haram over the past few years has revealed a highly politicized Nigerian military unwholesomely beholden to the office of the president which has trickled down to the lower strata of the military and affected their strategy within the Nigerian public. With the Nigerian public being denied factual reports on the government's management of the crisis in northern Nigeria, this has only helped in stoking the flames of suspicion and heightened the fear of the Florida, which hunts many Nigerians. Just before now, many Muslims I spoke to in Kano, particularly, and in Bornu, insisted that Boko Haram was a figment of a collusion between the Americans and Goodluck Jonathan's government 
which wanted to find a way of besmirching their faith. It was impossible to fathom to, to them that self described Muslims would do such a thing, so it had to be others. The prospective governor of one of the states in the northern region who was given to the fre frequent use of social media initially began to allude to the attackers being non northerners at, at the, the height of car bombings and suicide bombings against northern churches on Sundays in northern Nigeria. The accusation, the, the accusation stick, which was then used to beat the PDP. Uh, the, uh, the former leader of the political party in Nigeria, and vice versa, before he finally began to accuse the military chiefs of southern extraction of having a connection with the bombings, was this. This of, co this, of course, brings us back to the idea of the other in northern Nigeria. Last year in January, a famous Salafi cleric who disagreed with Muhammad Yusuf over doctrinal issues and became one of his strongest critics, Sheikh Mohamedou Awad Albani, popularly known, known as Albani Zaria, was killed along with his family by Boko Haram members. Before the details of Albani, uh, Albani's death became clear and reached the public, there was a lot of speculation about who his killers were, his killers were and this created a lot of tension. Fingers were immediately pointed at the others. It had to be either the Shia or the Christians, I was told in Kano, since Sheikh Albani had spoken with derision about both, both groups in the past. I was told that reprisal attacks were already being planned against Shia Muslims and Christians. Thankfully, Imam Abu Bakr Shikau came out shortly after and claimed responsibility for the death of Sheikh Albani. For a bit of added context, one of Sheikh Albani's writings was considered essential reading for Bukhara members prior to 2009. But in tune with their rigid view of takfirism that any Muslim who disagrees with them cannot be a Muslim, he then fell into the category of the others. So the same fear of the other which has thrived in northern Nigeria since the pogroms of, against the Igbos in the 60s and thrives today, today within the, the religious fair, when magnified, can be seen as the driving force behind movements such as the Quran. Reconstruction has to be made at the social level to rectify this, and this might itself need to be a continuous process to address the mirror cleavages which exist between tribes and faiths in northern Nigeria. The next uh, rubric I, I've titled, uh, and, uh, which as well as a question, is there a role for Islamic scholars to play within a post book around phase? While inevitably there will be ulama, uh, those Islamic scholars, who refuse to be seen as collaborators with the government, the government of Nigeria will require the help of those who are willing to help in providing counter narratives to the ones being put forward by Boko Haram, which focus on the demonizing and subhumanizing of those who do not fall within their rigid category of what it means to be a true Muslim. So far, all I have noticed is arguing around technicalities which only serves the favor of Boko Haram, more so as they do not believe in discourse of the Socratic type. Only Islamic scholars are well placed to address and articulate some harsh facts. If done by non-Northerners or non-Muslims, these facts will most likely, likely be dismissed. For all the goods and clerics such as Sheikh Dahiru Bochi have done in terms of urging their followers to strive for peace, we have to acknowledge the complicity of many of our revered Islamic scholars in the, the rise of Boko Haram, either by omission or commission. Sheikh Jafar Adam Mahmoud was Yusuf's mentor and was a popular cleric in northern Nigeria. Many of his tapes are still sold all over northern Nigeria, available on Islamic websites, on YouTube, and hawked in traffic in Kano. He was one of the many famous Islamic clerics with access to print media, television, and radio who promoted Islamic radicalism in northern Nigeria, particularly in Borno, where he preached frequently at Muhammadu Indemi Mosque, with the eponymous Indemi as his patron. His disagreement with Yusuf was not on the issue of Yusuf declaring certain groups of people infidels or classifying allegiance to the government at the, at the time as tagut, which means uh, idolatry, but on the permissibility of secular education. As a member of the Salafi sect, the Izala, uh, the, the full, the full uh, <coughs> let me uh, try this, uh, Jamatu Ikamatu Bidawa, Wait. <laughs> Jamatu Ikamatu Bida Ikamatu Suna. Yeah, please. Yes. I'll try this again. Jamati is a lot to be that what you come out to sooner. 
It's close. <laughs> I'm sweating already. <laughs> he was of the mind that for, for Muslims to control the state, they need to acquire secular education. In other words, he wasn't stating that he believed secular education to be intrinsically good or beneficial, but that pragmatically to ensure the, the, the achievement of their higher aim of being governed by true Muslims, as opposed to unbelievers, they needed to use secular education as a vehicle. Other names that come to mind include Dr. Dati Ahmed, the medical doctor and leader of the Supreme Council of Sharia in Nigeria, which Yusuf also belonged to, based in Kano, and Sheikh Mohammedu bin Uthman, one of the young popular Kano clerics of the famous champion mosque Salafi group, who now preaches at his own mosque in Taramin, which is highly patronized, uh, I, should, I should add. Both are highly respected popular clerics with a lot of sway. And Dati was actually chosen by Boko Haram to head negotiations with the government at a point until he and the sect both backed out after talks broke down with the government, with blame placed at the, at, at the door of good luck, Jonathan's committee with good reasons. White Uthman's name was mentioned by Boko Haram as one of the few people they would allow to negotiate with the government on their behalf. I mentioned this to show the amount of respect both Dati and Uthman command on both sides of the, the divide. Dati and Uthman some years ago began raising alarm about the danger of polio immunization, warning Muslims not to let their children be immunized. They both claimed that it was an attempt by the West and by Christians to sterilize the fast growing Muslim population of the North. Uthman in his sermons also warned Muslims to beware of the dangers of polio immunization by world organizations, warning that their intentions were not as altruistic as made to seem. He said that it, it was part of a larger global coordinated attack against Islam. I mentioned these two names because these are highly revered Islamic scholars within and beyond canon who have a large listening audience wherever they go. Following these sermons, gunmen suspected to be Boko Haram members in 2012 went to a clinic where polio immunization workers operated from and killed the people inside the building, escaping in a tricycle. So what I'm driving at is that some harm has been done by, by certain scholars who still hold illogical and conservative views which have helped in spreading the fear of the other in Northern Nigeria. As such, other equally respected scholars, I feel, have an important role to play in stemming this tide. This, this is important because at their core, the issues being raised by Boko Haram are in actuality not novel. They were not created in a vacuum, and in spite of the diligent efforts, particularly by the Salafi al Sunnah movement to wash its hands off of this Frankenstein monster, it is the collective creation of the years of ethno-religious strife which have come to characterize northern Nigeria, northern Nigeria since independence from the British. Within the sociology of northern Nigeria, the fear of Christian proselytization, using secular education as a ruse, has always persisted. Also, the fear of secular education acting as a conduit towards the eventual moral corrosion of children has always existed. In a study conducted among the Kanuri, who make up the bulk of Boko Haram's demographic in Bornu as, as early as the 70s, a researcher found that this fear existed widely among them. The resentment by the poor of the lifestyles of the rich has always been there. The northern elite were favored by the British. And if the social rigidity of northern hierarchy wasn't enough, the British then ensured that after their departure, this rigid, rigid, rigidity in terms of social mobility would remain so by effectively treating secular education as a luxury ticket, which only those from certain northern families are entitled to. And finally, what about the contentious issue of whether or not, or not the government should be doing more to monitor sermons and Islamic preachers? The country's intelligence agencies focus on monitoring Christian and Islamic preachers and their sermons, especially during the years of the military, particularly after Sanya Bacha came into power and imprisoned MQ Abiola in the 90s. Fueled in part by paranoia and in part by the mobilization of progressive minded fellows around the symbolism of June 12 to form NADECO, a group which had the primary aim of bringing an end to Abacha's dictatorship and restoring democracy. Abacha galvanized the intelligence agencies to make sure that all dissenting voices were sniffed out and were either intimidated, arrested, or killed. Many places of worship with firebrand clerics, an example being Tunde Bakari, famous then for his fiery sermons against the military, were monitored regularly. On the Islamic side of the, the spectrum in northern Nigeria particularly, the Iran-inspired Shia movement, or Sheikh Ibrahim Azazaki, which has the largest and most visible following of Shia Muslims in Nigeria, bore the brunt of this 
and Azazaki was imprisoned for the bulk of Abacha's rule for his teachings, who were, which were unpretentiously against the, Ni the Nigerian state. I've mentioned these two examples to show a recognition and appreciation of the complexities which arise with regards to contemplating the et ethical morality, or otherwise, of monitoring sermons and places of worship. However, in a northern Nigeria which has the highest rates of sectarian violence in West Africa, in which on numerous occasions collective violence has begun after incendiary statements were made in places of worship, the question has to be asked if the numerous deaths caused in, in their wake could have been avoided with some practical checks being made by the government. The truth of the matter is that Boko Haram, as we know it today, can be defeated in the same way as the Maita Sene was defeated, in the same way as the Mahdi's revolt of Malam Jibrila was defeated. But the idea behind it will always exist. But I humbly propose that if measures and structures are put in place to ensure that preachers, organizations and worship centers seeking to propagate these toxic ideas are stifled, then, for, then future incarnations of Boko Haram can be prevented from blossoming. Thank you. few slides that I wanted to use to support them, some of the things I was going to say to you. Sorry. Um, I was trying to set up the slides. Unfortunately, I haven't. Uh, um, actually, I will try and help you do some of that. Um, both that I and Amy have touched on some of the issues that I would have loved to have talked about. But unfortunately, they they got the better end of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just talk about, I'll just talk about some, some pretty boring stuff and, and a few figures, and a few figures which, which might interest you. But I mean, basically my argument is, a lot has been said about Boko Haram and the reasons behind this and, 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 and like I said, they have highlighted some of these issues. However, what I've found out in, 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 in the process in, in the last couple of years when I've talked about Boko Haram, I've been in, I've sat down in discussions regarding Boko Haram is that a lot of argument has come out that it's a poor level of development in, in northern Nigeria, in the northeast actually, that has fueled the emergence of, of, of um, insurg insurgency groups like Boko Haram. So I, I thought it would be useful if we could examine whether this is the case. It is really northern, northeastern Nigeria really that badly developed when compared to the rest of the, of the country, or other parts of northern Nigeria? And because it becomes important, if we're talking about reconstruction after Boko Haram has been defeated. And how we go about it, who's responsible, you know, I mean, those are two key questions I'd like to, to just have a look at, you know. Um, so my brief is in two parts, the first looking at comparing the level of the development between the regions of Nigeria, using social in indicators, just such as the level of education, unemployment, health, and with health, I'm looking at maternal and infant health, and then the level of poverty, to see if there are really any significant differences that we can use to say to support the argument that the Northeast is so underdeveloped that that is why we have a huge um, uh, problem there. The second part asks who is responsible for the level of development or the level of underdevelopment. The federal, the state, or the local government. Nigeria, the federal, has a federal structure, and um, and each each of the units of government have a responsibility regarding certain social uh, social uh, issues. So that, that's how I want to approach it. So I'll, I'll start by looking at unemployment rate in Nigeria. 
Um, the unemployment rate in Nigeria has been increasing since 2002. At that point, the rate was 12.6%. However, in 2011, which is the cutoff point which I've used, it, it had risen to 23.9%, with youth unemployment at 50%. And then when you compare that to Ghana and Kenya, Ghana had a youth unemployment rate of 11% and Kenya had 40%. You can see that there's a huge um, disparity in the figures. Uh, in northern Nigeria, the situation is actually much worse due to the low level of investment in the private sector. So there's a huge, a lot of dependency on the government. Uh, the low level of investment in the private sector has seen a decrease in private sector investment. And this has seen the main employers in the neighborhood, especially in places like Kaduna and Kran, which are two of the largest um, state capitals in northern Nigeria, um, collapse. Most of the private uh, companies have collapsed. And this is because there was an introduction of liberalization policies that made most of these companies very uncompetitive. This has led to a rising number of graduates with limited unemployment opportunities, and so it has created a possible pool of recruits for fundamental preachers and groups. Um, in, in 2011, unemployment rate in Adama, Yobe, and Bono states, which are the three states I wish I could put it on my slide. Which are the three states where the Boko Haram insurgency has been has, has most affected? Um, the unemployment rate in those three states were 18.4%, 35.6%, and 29.1%, respectively, which is much higher than the national average of 23.9%. But what is important to note is that other states, such as Bochi, which is also in the northeast, Gombe, had a rate of 41.4 and 13.4%, which is much higher than the three states where the insurgency is occurring. Niger State, which is in the north central, had an unemployment rate of 39.4%. While Zampara, which is in the northwest at the other end, had an unemployment rate of 42.6%, which are much, rates much higher, you know, and they didn't have the level of insurgency as those states in the northeast, even though Bochi and Gombe have some insurgency groups, but none of them have been violent as Boko Haram and things. Um, so it makes you wonder what exactly is the cause of this? Is this we just keep on saying that it is because the states, those areas are seriously under underdeveloped? That is why we see the rise of insurgencies. Um, looking at health in indicators, um, I mean, maternal mortality was highest in the northeast and northwest, with figures of 1,549 and 1,026 deaths per 100,000 live births, respectively. I and mean, when you compare that to the southwest and the southeast, the southwest the figure is 165, and in the southeast the figure is 286. So that's a huge disparity in the way uh, health, um, maternal health, um, maternal health is is in, in, in those two areas. I mean, 1,500 to 286. That's, that's a huge, huge disparity. And infant mortality figures are not much better. Um, in the northeast and northwest, figures of 260 and 269 deaths per 1,000 births, respectively, while the southwest and southeast figures are 176 and 103. So there's, the, the, the gap with, in terms of in, uh, infant mortality is not as bad as when you look at maternal mortality. Although the government recently came out and said that the figures for maternal mortality have dropped to about 350, although I, I still find that hard to believe. But, uh, that's, um, in terms of education, the northeastern zone is also very poor when you look at primary school enrollments and literacy rates, with the differences within the regions quite glaring. Uh, the northern states have much lower primary enrollment when compared to the southern states. Um, however, these figures must be seen within the context of the south, the north being a late comer in terms of provision of Western education. And this uh, I can explain why literacy rates and enrollment rates are, are still quite low in those states. Um, the biggest issue in Nigeria now, I think, is, is poverty. And um, eradicating poverty remains one of its biggest challenges. The country has been branded a rich country with poor people. Because even with the rising GDP and the recent rebasing of the GDP that made the country the largest economy in Africa, the World Bank and the Nigerian Bureau, National Bureau of Statistics estimate that 68% of Nigeria's 170 million people now live below the poverty level of one dollar a day. That's about 112 million. And those are huge figures. Um, and the, 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 um, the rise in poverty rates between 1980 and 2011 is quite alarming because in, in 1980 it was about 12.7%, and now it's about 6 9%. It's 
so that means the country has been digressing um, seriously in the last 20, 30 odd years. Um, so the social indica indicators provide a very bleak picture of the state of development in the country, but, but especially in the north. But it is safe to say that the indices of development in the northeastern states are not too different from other parts of the north and other parts of the country. So while the development might exacerbate grievances, almost all the states in the north share similar social indices. And this begs the question, why have states such as Jigawa, Niger, Nasara, and Zabra, which have lower, poorer social indices than the northeastern states where Boko Haram is, is rampant? Um, why have they not seen the kind of insurgent groups that we see? <coughs> and should we be worried that the continued underdevelopment might increase the risk of the emergence of such groups in other states? And if that's the case, then we must understand what needs to be done to address the slide so that uh, we can reduce, mitigate against the risk of some of these groups using this as a, as a platform for carrying out attacks. Um, and, and what I found also interesting is that Boko Haram has managed to incorporate the issue of underdevelopment into its narrative. You know? and, and the whole argument is that it is the Western educated people who are using the funds that are due for everyone to enrich themselves while the poor remain poor. And, and, and if we don't change that narrative, and the only way we can do that is by improving the level of development in those areas. And once we can change that narrative, then they won't have that kind of uh, foundation to build on, which is what they found quite easy to do right now. Um, so, but it's also important to appreciate that even if the level of development increases, I mean, improves because from what um, Amy and, um, and Atas said, and I mean, I tell me some very pertinent issues that I, I would have loved to have talked about myself, but, um, there's no guarantee that we we'll see the, that we will not see the emergence of such groups because there are other issues, of course, involved in in in, um, in why these groups uh, emerge. Um, so it, it, this brings me to the second part of my briefing regarding responsibility. Like I said, the current narrative seems to place the problem solely at the feet of the federal government. However, I think that while the federal government must shoulder the blame in the areas of employment and poverty to some extent. Uh, poverty reduction, given that it is responsible for the economy, the state governments must share as much responsibility, especially in areas of health, education programs that are jointly funded and jointly run by the federal, state, and local government. Because Nigeria has something called the concurrent list on its constitution, where health and education are run by the three tiers of government. So, people cannot, it cannot be, the states cannot argue that the federal government has done nothing for them, because they get the funding for these things. And, but because they don't do what they're supposed to do and there's no accountability in the Nigerian state, they can raise their voices now and claim that the problem why they're here is impoverished is not because of them, it's because of the federal government. Well, we've had 16 years of governance in those areas and little has changed in terms of any of these social indicators uh, because they just, the state government are just not being held responsible for, for some of these things. Um, I mean, time did not permit me to access the budget and expenditure data from some of these states to analyze allocations to the social sector. You know, but, um, but the event allocated to the various states between 2000 and 2011, didn't get my thing up, showed that um, the northeastern states were not any worse off than some of the other states in the north or some of the other states in the southeast, which where some of the states actually had poorer um, allocations in terms of in, in relation to population than some of the northeastern states. But they don't have these kind of problems that the northeastern states have. So for a state which is in the northwest on the other end, it's actually much worse off in most of the indicators than the northeastern states. But even though Ansari, which is a splinter group of Boko Haram, had its base in that area, they, never, they, they haven't seen the kind of violence that we see in, in the northeast. So it begs the question, what have the state government been doing with the funds that have been allocated to them for these, um, for this uh, social um, issues, to tackle some of these social issues. I mean, Kano State, which has a population of about 9.4 million people, has a much lower revenue figure in terms of population, but has better indices for education, health, and infrastructure development. And I mean, if people just have to go to Kano to know and to see the way uh, human capital development, uh, infrastructural development, education, health, how it's being tackled. And it's all about governance and, and having the political will to tackle it. And I think the governments of those three states, Adama, Yobe, and, and Borno, never had the political will to try and tackle some of these issues. And um, 
one of the people who, one of the governors who, who ruled for eight years is the, is the person that he was talking about, um, Modi Sharif. I mean, he's been indicted as being somebody who funded Boko Haram. And um, I mean, right now he has an ongoing battle with the anti-corruption agency. They're, they're, they're charging him with um, corruptly uh, enriching himself to the tune of 300 billion naira. I mean, some of these people have kind of ties when it comes to the anti-corruption agency, so you, you, can, you can't take it. But, but the state governments haven't done enough in that instance. And we cannot just put the responsibility solely on the federal government. Each arm of government needs to be able to stand up and be accounted for when it comes to some of these issues. Primary education is the responsibility of the local government councils. But because the state governments have taken over control of the revenue of local government councils, it's almost impossible for them to carry out that function. But having said that, again, the state governments themselves are probably worse than the local governments because they get the funding, they get extra funding, uh, for most states, I'm sure, but in some part of the ecological fund, which is a special fund, intervention fund, for areas that have uh, ecological problems. And most of these funds are never ever used for what the, the, the purpose they're set up for. So if we don't, if we don't um, address some of these issues, what will happen is that some of these so-called insurgent groups will find a platform to argue that it is still the Western educated people that are now corruptly enriching themselves at the detriment of the people that live in, the, in, the, that live in those areas. And that is why we are going to fight them. And um, fortunately, the incoming government has indicated a renewed drive to improve the situation in these areas. And this will have to include providing the foundation for changing the narratives so that the population in these areas will not feel disenfranchised, even if this is currently a wrong perception. Before I came for this um, presentation, I read that the Governor of Burundi was demanding for 13 percent oil derivation to be given to the state. I mean, it's a wrong, it's a, it's a wrong uh, demand. I think what the state needs is a kind of Marshall Plan where a certain amount of money is 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 um, allocated to try and rehabilitate some of the areas that have been destroyed by Boko Haram, and then a longer term plan that will sort of reduce some of the issues. But the issues are not just are not uh, are not restricted to the northeast of Nigeria. There's problem is the national problem. And until the whole issue is tackled at the national level, with ideo ideological groups like Boko Haram in the north, you could have the emergence and the rise of certain groups like that. Thank you very much. Great. Um, before I throw it out to you to ask any questions that you wish of, of our speakers, I thought it might be worth just tying together some of the, the key themes and some of the key threads that, that we heard in these presentations. And I, I see kind of three key issues that seem to be emerging here. Well, the first one is that, that Boko Haram shouldn't be treated as a, as a monolithic entity. There was an interesting theme, I think, that particularly ran through Barkindo's and, and Guinea's presentations about internal factions and internal divisions uh, within the insurgency. And, Crucial ideological distinctions between leaders, so important changes within the group uh, during the transition between Yusuf and Shekau, for example. So that adds a layer of complexity, that this organisation, this group has changed over time, uh, and perhaps we have to think through the ramifications of, of those changes. Secondly, very different analyses here about the, the complex causes of Boko Haram in the first place. How much is this about long-standing regional and other divisions uh, within Nigerian society? How much is it about much more proximate causes around political antagonisms, uh, religious divisions, uh, relative economic development, issues of youth disaffection? Different viewpoints on how we should interpret the, the causes. And as an inevitable result of that, I think very different interpretations regarding the necessary responses to, to Boko Haram. How much is this a question of accountability, either for actors in Boko Haram or at different levels of the government? How much is this a, a, an ideological or religious issue that requires de-radicalization of the kind that uh, Atha's talking about in the prisons? What's the role of Islamic scholars? Any, I think, makes a very provocative claim that perhaps the best response has to come from inside <laughs> Islam itself. But there's no point in outsiders trying to get too involved. They'll simply be seen as illegitimate. The change has to, has to come from Islamic scholars themselves. How much is this a question of reconciliation and rebuilding relations at, at various levels of society? And finally, I guess, 
Bala throws out a challenge to say, look, uh, maybe we're barking up the wrong tree if we think this is only about economic development. There have to be other factors at play because arguably the Northeast isn't even the most impoverished part of uh, Nigeria. Why is it facing this kind of insurgency when most other states in Nigeria aren't? So challenging the, the thesis of economic development being the, the core component here. So lots of different issues, different perspectives from the three, and I think they've given us a good foundation for a, for a debate and a discussion uh, with you all now. So. I'm happy to take questions from whoever. And maybe um, when I ask you to ask your question, if you could just briefly tell us who, who you are, uh, that would be good. I see lots of hands, so I might group the questions together too, if that's okay with, with the three of you. I'll take them in kind of clusters of three. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Johan, I'm a PhD student here uh, at SOAS. I work on uh, Pakistan and the uh, amazing parallel you know, between the situation described in northern Nigeria and in um, Pakistan, especially in the northwest of the country. Um, so my, it's a, I actually have two questions. The first question is that I find it like actually very forward thinking um, and, uh, and exciting the idea of reconciliation and reconstruction uh, you know, to, be, to be so boldly considered at such an early stage. Um, especially because there were hints uh, in the presentation, but that's actually not just something that you do after the defeat of Boko Haram, but that may be necessary uh, in order to, to, to defeat a movement like this. But um, it also begs the question of, I mean, in some ways, uh, all, all kind of you almost take it for granted that this movement can or will be defeated. Um, and I actually have to ask, um, what's the basis for that? Um, the world changes. It could possibly be that this is uh, a reality that has come to stay. I mean, given how fragile governance has been, how fragile uh, even the military as an institution has been in terms of its ability to sustain, uh, you know, its 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 uh, its presence, um, who's to say that it will be defeated, or that you know, uh, or that either this movement or or some movement like it, right? So that's one question. The other question is that um, uh, you know. Uh, there's, there's been references to the uh, Salafi movement, but the Salafi movement's presence you know, outside the Arab world is relatively recent. It's something that has grown since the 1970s. And for example, in Pakistan, um, you saw that happen side by side with the delegitimization of older, more traditional forms of Islamic spirituality. Um, they almost sort of go out of fashion, they're seen as backwards, uh, un Islamic, too tainted by native religion, whatever that might be. And I was wondering if there was something similar that happened in northern Nigeria. If um, earlier, you know, like more traditional forms of Islam found themselves delegitimized and marginalized that allowed to create the space for these more radical uh, forms of Islam to uh, become hegemonic. Great, thanks. The gentleman behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Akio Yitabi from Africa Department. I left you here. So. Um, I just want to ask whether there is a, a link, a continuation. You mentioned my Tassila, it can be for any of you actually, uh, in the 70s. And the trajectory between that and the other groups that um, uh, that the you know, mentioned at the beginning of the different sects that are there, I mean, that of Kokohara. And also to know that there is a, the, the war in the 70s and the methods and uh, the techniques of, of the Islamic today is different from what is happening now in connection with what is happening in the Islamic State and uh, you know, a, num a number of connections everywhere. So uh, is there a trajectory there? And are we seeing a situation where things are curved as it was in, in, in the 70s? And also, uh, the second thing is, is there an avenue to inform government from what you're finding on the ground, so that this government that is just you know, at least trying to do something about the situation now can listen and begin to uh, take steps in the next I'll take one more question in this round and then we'll, we'll have another round. There's one just on the right here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I have a few questions. Uh, for paying to the question, I was very Could you tell us who you are, uh, please? For me, I'm a law student here. I was very intrigued how you started off saying that what is kind of like a post-Boko Haram situation going to look like. 
So I was also kind of intrigued to say, maybe this is something that's here to stay, but just to throw out an idea, what is the possibility of carving out a Boko Haram state and letting them stay? Like, what do you think about that kind of idea? Um, especially <coughs> with the link with ISIS, uh, Boko Haram pledging the year to ISIS, Al-Shabaab, etc. Do you think it's really, as you were tying in, a regional issue? Or can Nigeria just say, look, take this land, forget about it? That's <laughs> <laughs> a nice provocative question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's start with Guinea and move back down the panel. I'm sure you'll each have views on each of the questions. So, yeah, Guinea. Thank you. Well, with regards to the first, uh, the first question, um, if, 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 I, if, I, if I got you correctly, um, you're asking if Bokram's existence comes as, as a result of a, a vacuum left behind by the delegitimization of earlier Islamic groups. Um, I think, to an extent, it can be seen as that. Um, because Bokhran itself is uh, the latest in an incarnation. Uh, 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 it's, it's sort of undergone different, different cycles of rebirth, essentially. Uh, and I think the, the, late, the, the, the latest, or rather the, the last in the Saxon incarnation before it became what it, it's known as now, was when it, they were expelled from the Mamadou Indemi Mosque in Maiduguri. And before then, they worshipped with the members of the, 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 the sect I mentioned, the Izalatu, the, the, Jib, uh, the, the, the Asian just known as the Jibris, the Jamatu, Izalatu, Dida, or Ikamatu, Sunya. And they also belong to the, the Salafi, the Salafi Sunni strand of, of, of Islam. And with the gas to book around, it's, it's, it's complex, because the, the problem I, I have with many of the, the the analysis out there is people usually tend to assume that it's a situation where you can just extrapolate other uh, equations that you use for other groups like ISIS or you know Al Qaeda, where it's a two plus two equals four, and you just extrapolate that in northeastern Nigeria, and then you get the same form, uh, you know, the same re result. But the the, the the catalyst in northeastern Nigeria are different. So you, you've got um, different context, uh, context you have to consider with regards to the birth of Boko Haram, such as um, the, the, the de delegitimization of the, the Islamic scholars, the ulama, particularly within the Izala in northeastern Nigeria. So that, that de delegitimization of the scholars, because they were seen as being too chummy with the government, the, the local state uh, government, it sort of made the, the commoners look at them as not being on their side. And so that, had, um, um, that created sort of a space for preachers like Muhammad Yusuf, Abu Bakr Shikar, to set up their own mosques and then start preaching. Uh, and their, their rhetoric um, took a, a, a populist, populist sort of a, um, accent to it. And that sort of allowed the youth to, 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 to move more towards what they were saying. Um, now with regards to the other question uh, by uh, Dr. Vital about um, Links, possible links and, and parallels um, between um, um, other um, previous Islamist uh, groups like uh, the, the, the Mai Tai Sina, the Lented Sina, as, as they were called, and, um, and uh, Boko Haram. I, I would say um, um, yes, very much so. And it also, I, I think, <coughs> also links with um, the, the first question as well, uh, where you asked if we had sort of just concluded that a uh, Boko Haram is something that's going to be wiped out within a particular um, period. Uh, um, I mean, if, if I'm able to, to preempt uh, the, the other two gentlemen, I, I don't think it's, it's not so much that we've concluded that Boko Haram is going to be wiped out or anything. It's more of um, a presumption that at some point, even if Boko Haram is not wiped out, there will be a need for reconstruction and reconciliation. Because, um, uh, look, we don't know, we're not you know, Nostradamus or anything, so we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But one thing we do know for a fact is that the people who were displaced from all these towns, villages, and even cities that were taken over previously by Boko Haram will need to, at some point in the not too distant future, return to their homes. Because Boko Haram, at the moment, is reduced uh, numerically. The, um, and and uh, this is... Um, word that I've gotten from people who've been talking actually with Boko Haram, um, um, the, the, um, the top echelon of Boko Haram from Imam Abu Bakr Shikar down to the, 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 the foot soldiers and they've told me uh, on a first and basis that the fighters are demoralized, the fighters don't want to fight anymore. They never thought that uh, the, 
the fighting would sort of escalate to the skill that it's taken on. Because one thing you need to remember is most of these guys are not, well, I suppose, li uh, literally, they're not monsters. Most of them come from Bornu State. Most of them lived within m many of the, the towns, as uh, myself and uh, and uh, as I mentioned, most of them lived within the towns that they later turned on and destroyed. So most of them would like, in in uh, in a utopic world, to return. So they they, they 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 themselves don't want a situation where they're living in the forest, which is where they are now. So I suppose when we look at that, it leads us to conclude that at some point, even if these guys are, are, are not entirely wiped out which I suppose is impossible, they will at some point just fizzle out. Um, yes, and uh, with, yes, uh, the, the question about the, the, the parallels between um, previous Islamist groups. Yes, um, with the Maite Sine, I, I think one of the things we need to um, remember is uh, this happened in the 70s. We didn't have social media. There was no YouTube. Uh, wait, wait. I'm not sure if the internet existed then. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm a caveman, so I wouldn't know anyway. But, um, I mean, you know, we didn't have YouTube, Facebook, or uh, things like that. Uh, but what we do know is there were loads of human rights uh, uh, abuses that, um, that took place. Um, many of the members were killed. But then what happened is the ones who were not killed, actually, uh, actually extrajudicially, and were not imprisoned, um, and given life sentences, sort of just blended in again with, um, with, with members of, of, the, of the public. And that's why you'll notice that there are very strong parallels between the teachings of uh, um, Mohamed Marwa, the founder of the, the, the Yantad Sinha, and, um, and, 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 and the beliefs of, of Bukhara. Although um, it also has to be mentioned, some of the beliefs that these um, different Islamic sects uh, uh, espouse are really just a common ideas that exist amongst commoners in northern Nigeria. So I, I think even if we do see the end of Boko Haram, it's possible that we'll also, it's pos if these um, things that we've mentioned, if these structures are not put in place, we will probably see another set come up tomorrow and claim to, to be the new Boko Haram. Sorry for, for, for going on. Uh, anyway, he has mentioned most of the things, but uh, let me just talk briefly. I mean, should we accept that Boko Haram has come to stay? I mean, even someone suffering from cancer, he knows he may die tomorrow. He believes that somehow there will be a miracle. If you really live under Boko Haram, it's very difficult. Forget about the academic arguments. You are really a victim. It's very difficult. You hope that one day we can get rid of these people. So there's no way, I come from that region, no way we are going to accept that Boko Haram is going to be there forever. We hope. And that's why we are talking of post-conflict reconstruction. So we are trying to think ahead. And that is what we are doing. Now, the other aspect about the traditional Islamic sects that were existing before, yes, there always has been Islamic resistance in Nigeria, even before the coming of the colonial masters. We had the traditional Sufi groups, the Tijaniya and the Kadaria, and they were really very, very strong at that time. There are a lot of Imams who were very influential. But because of the establishment of the colonial system of state that destroyed most of the Islamic structures, you had other, you know, resistant groups that spore up, like the Gardenchi movement, the Mahadi groups, the Maitasine, and then Boko Haram. And I think that as long as people feel that their religion is not being treated well within this Western concept of state, you are always going to have that resistance. And that's why even in the most developed world like America, you still have these problems. So even if Nigeria is able to achieve the best economy in the world, it's not, it's not true that this kind of resistance will go away. People always somehow use religion, you know. And the other aspect is whether these new systems of fighting Boko Haram or fighting Islamic groups is, is different you know, from the past and the present. And I think that with Boko Haram, most of the difference is that it's because for me, it exists at this regional porous border. I was at the Lake Chad. There used to be massive irrigation projects, fishing projects, and fishing unions, but the lake has almost dried up. And most of those who refused to go to school and were depending on fishing and farming and irrigation can no longer survive because of this. And that is why Boko Haram knows the language, they know the area, they have the local content, they can really go across the porous borders very, very easily. And you have to know we had the Lake Chad Commission, for example. Nigeria, Niger, and Chad. 
could not even collaborate to maintain this commission as a regional commission, much more of collaborating to maintain security at this border region. So there's a real serious problem of colonial grievances. Chad, Niger, Cameroon, they belong to France. Nigeria is British. Some of us are even British German. I used to belong to the German colony, handed over to the British, and now handed over to Nigeria. I don't even know whether I'm German or British or Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have all this kind of colonial identity confusion at this border region, and Boko Haram is really able to exploit that. Am I able to give us some of this information to the government? It's really, really a very serious thing. In Nigeria, information, to get the true information is very, very difficult. And you really have to be very cautious and very careful. Particularly as a student and a scholar coming from that region, where your family is known, your people are known, you really have to be very careful. So I'm very cautious. I don't know what Bala, um, <laughs> but for me, I'm, I'm really, really very cautious. The possibility of carving out a state for Boko Haram, I'm afraid that is not going to happen. We are far away. So I don't think we are going to allow that. It's not going to be possible. We need people to be together, you know, rather than carving out this. And you have to understand that Boko Haram represents barely 1%. Is it every Kanuri that would like to have an independent state? Even before Nigeria became independent in 1960, there were agitations. The Borno Youth Movement, for example, they really didn't want to be part of Nigeria. But we have come a long way. And Boko Haram is a very lone voice. So, I mean, you cannot cover that group and give, what, how can Shekau and others, how do they set up a government? If they set up a government, how are they going to carry out diplomatic missions? Who is going to be the foreign affairs minister? Who are they going to talk? <laughs> These things cannot work. At the end of the day, the little percentage of the number of people who belong to that state will actually be the victims. And I think Nigeria as a responsible state cannot allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, actually, your question was what uh, actually was just go. I, I don't know why you thought that that would be a logical, like... Uh, oh, no, it's just a thought-provoking question. Know? And because Boko Haram, what they've done in the last two, three years is that they've sacked the communities. Now, if you say you're going to cover a part of that community, that <coughs> area and give it to them, who are they going to rule over? I mean, Boko Haram's ideology is something that the people with me for a long time, because normally when you're trying to overrun an area and you want to set up a, a, a caliphate, you have to have people that are able to rule over. But if you go in there and kill everybody, it just doesn't make sense. You know, so that's, like, so that's, that's sort of boggled my mind. So when you came up with the whole idea of having a portion of Nigeria, I, it doesn't solve the problem anyway, because I think it just don't be a problem, the, the new caliphate that you're suggesting will still become a problem for Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad. But I, I think the reason why we're all hopeful and we all talk about post Post Boko Haram is the fact that Nigerians are a very hopeful people. You know? We sort of believe that things will go away. I remember when the thing happened in the 80s. It just went away. I mean, the military attacked them. And, went. And, and we think that the reason why this hasn't happened with Boko Haram is because the government, the outgoing government, didn't have the political will to try and tackle Boko Haram. And they didn't fund the military well enough. And they, they, they actually did not believe that Boko Haram was a, like you said, they, they believed it was a ragtag organization which would just go away. I mean, President Obasanjo just said when he went to meet the president, good luck, and talk, told him that he wanted to go to meet to talk to Boko Haram, and he wanted to be briefed about Boko Haram, the president told him that it's just a ragtag group. And it's that level of nonchalance that led to it getting to where it is now. I don't think it was, it was something that happened overnight. So um, that's why we're hopeful, you know. Um, and um, the issue of, uh, well, the doc doctor has gone, but um, I mean, I, I think the reason, one of the reasons why um, Boko Haram, I mean, I, I go back to Sharia and the introduction of Sharia in 1999 in Nigeria. And, and what that did was it gave a lot of northern, you have to understand how entrenched Islam is in northern Nigeria. It's extremely entrenched. Most northern Nigerian Muslims see the world through the eyes of Islam. And, and Sharia gave them an opportunity to live their life according to what they felt were their ideals. But unfortunately, most of the, the introduction of Sharia and most of the states was done purely for political reasons. So the kind of justice that they thought they would get, they didn't get. And that's why groups like Boko Haram now have come out, came out to fill the void and say, look, these people that have said they've introduced Sharia in the first instance to make your life better, they did all of that just to cover your eyes. And, and then people started feeling a lot 
the St. Chantan, and that's why it's easy for groups like Boko Haram and the Shia group in Zaria and the Kalakato in Bochi and so on to, to have people with large, huge unemployment levels and things like that. They use religion to, to be the voice that will help them mobilize these people. We'll take another round of questions. Goodness, there are hands kind of going up left and right. So I'll, I might gather a few more than three this time. I'm going to, and then I'll start with Bala because I'm conscious that Bala keeps having to wait for him by window, and then uh, so that seems very unfair. So we'll start with Bala. Yeah, you have a question for Bala. Okay, well, that's good. Um, My name is Sydney Glisserman, I'm a master's student at UCL. And Adam was talking about you know, the maximalist versus the minimalist approach, and I was wondering about the potential for that minimalist, the potential for those negotiations, and what a positive negotiation with Boko Haram would look like. And if that potential is reduced under a Buhari administration, and if that potential is, is there with the current conditions of the organization. And along that line, I was also wondering with the economic situation, if there were to be these negotiations, how would one go about improving the economy and incentivizing people who would otherwise be militants without creating um, an amnesty reward situation like we've seen in the Delta? this round and then we'll have time for one more round after this, so, yeah. Um, Peter, I teach in politics department. Um, so this is a question which I think I've heard different answers to. Um, given how easy Boko Haram could label traditional authorities in the north as neo-colonial collaborators with British imperialism, how significant are they really for post-conflict negotiation? Right. A nice array of issues there. Yeah. Oh. Okay, um, first question. Why do you think the three states? Those are the three states that Boko Haram has actually been more active in. That's why I think Adama. those three states Adama, Borno, and, and Yubi. Those are the three states. Initially, Boko Haram started from Yubi. They were pushed out and they moved to Borno, but they had attacks in Adama and in those three states. They've had attacks in other parts of Northern but their concentration has been in those three states. And I think I say the reason why I say the government didn't have to go with Bono Sharif used, uh, what's his name, sorry, um, Modi Sharif used Boko Haram, and I think he talked about, he talked about that. He used, he used Boko Haram, I mean, it was a situation in, in Nigeria then where political elites used militias to further their political agendas. And Boko Haram just happened to be one of those that they fit into, you know, the situation in Borno State then. And like he, like he mentioned, the governor had ECOMOC, which is his own militia. In Bochi State, the governor had his own. In the Delta, the, the, the Delta and Rivers, the governors armed the militias, the men, and the, the people fighting. The politicians, they had a different grievance in those areas, but they were armed too by, by the politicians, because politicians used them conveniently for, for elections. And so in the North, in, 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 in Borno State, the governor armed, 
at least entered into uh, collaboration with Boko Haram, thinking that maybe it was the same kind of situation that you would get in the South West, and which is quite different because Boko Haram is based on an ideology, not on material gains. So it's very difficult for very difficult for him to change to change their mindset, and, and that's why. And I don't think he, he so he didn't have the political will to, uh, to address that issue, and that's why I said that. I mean, I don't know if they, they probably had the same problem, but, but because. Boko Haram is not situated in Adama per se, they just go into Adama to, to carry out attacks. So um, the former government, Nyako, was more concerned with other things, and he's up on corruption charges too, of millions of billions of naira. So you can see that they didn't want to address some of the underlying issues and some of the underlying grievances that some of that these groups have come up with. And that's why I said that they didn't I didn't believe that they had the full problem. Um, the issue of legitimacy, I don't think we said any of those grievances were Legitimate. We didn't say, we said this is what Boko Haram has said, but we didn't say that we felt that what they said was legitimate. Because we did say what, the, what they are fighting for is legitimate, then that means that obviously, like you said, after. We are not post, supporting Boko Haram. You know, after, post, after, the, after post Boko Haram, then obviously it would make sense to. In you, how do you go about reconciliation? You know, but we didn't, we don't. In their narratives, it is legitimate in their eyes. But some of the things they're asking for just don't make sense. You know, but. They feel that it's legitimate, and that's why they're fighting this fight, and that's why we, you know, but we don't think it's a legitimate thing. Um, Peter, um, you asked about um, how the traditional rulers can be a part of, and part of the problem with conflict resolution in northern Nigeria has been the fact that traditional rulers are not, they, they don't have the kind of legitimacy they used to have before. And, and what happens is that because in many cases, the conflicts are actually between two different groups. So what happens is that they always see the traditional leader as being supportive of one group over the other. That's the way it is. And if a traditional group is, if, if a traditional ruler is seen as the orthodox Muslim leader, then obviously if he's going to negotiate between Boko Haram and the traditional Muslim setting, the Boko Haram would think that he's going to lean more towards Boko Haram. And, and, and even when I did my, my field work in, in, in areas like Joss, the same problem happened when um, Mr. Kim Zuzo, which is Emi Ozaria, was sent in to negotiate between the Biroms and the Muslim community there, the Biroms didn't want it because he's part of a Fulani, House of Fulani tradition, which is Islamic. So they didn't want that. So there's a, there's a, there's a problem with issues of legitimacy regarding traditional rulers. Even in, even in non-Muslim areas, like in, between the chiefs and the chiefs, you cannot put a traditional ruler there to, to address all these issues because they will always be seen as being partisan towards one group or the other. So yes, that would be a problem in the long run, you know. Uh, the issue of negotiation, the maximum, you know, Buhari has said it very, very clearly that if you have two insurgencies, for the manager data, militants, and Boko Haram, he can't treat one different from the other. Jonathan had given up billions of dollars in oil contract protection of oil pipelines. So while he's giving out contracts to Niger Delta militants, they are busy bombing Boko Haram. So, according to Buhari, he is not going to do that. But the problem is that those who are already in prison, Boko Haram members who are already in prison, of course, it's true. The military has killed some in secret, but others have also been prosecuted. They have been given life sentences. But the fact is that the whole prison <coughs> institution in Nigeria at the moment is in decay. How are you going to keep these thousands of fighters in prison? With this economic problem, where are you going to get the money? These people have children, they have families. How are the families going to feel? How will the children, will they take up arms sometimes to fight on behalf of their parents? So I don't know the approach that Buhari is coming in with, but the program we are running now is that of Jonathan. He's trying to ensure they give professional <coughs> training, they check their mental health because they have killed before, they have all these sport psychologists and to see how they can truly rehabilitate them and take them back into the society. I had this training before in Singapore where some of the bombers were really rehabilitated and today they participate effectively in the Singaporean economy. It's a long-term project. It's a project that you may not feel the impact now. It may take years, but I think that it is good. So I don't know what approach Buhari will bring, but it's really of advantage. But what I'm sure is Buhari is not going to keep paying the Niger Delta militants oil contract money. That is not going to happen. Nigeria doesn't even have that money. <laughs> <laughs>
the issue of our legitimacy, we actually said it. We didn't say that the grievances or the narratives of Boko Haram are legitimate. You have to understand that even in 2012, 2013, the anti-terrorism bill was passed by the federal government, supported by the Americans. This bill was even amended in 2014. So much so that if you are in Nigeria and you commit terrorist act outside, it's a crime. I was arrested twice in Yola and in Abuja. Why? Because I tried to collect Boko Haram materials. In 1995 up to 2009, to have Boko Haram YouTube videos and their leaflets was nothing. But after 2009, it was even a crime. And then when the Anti-Terrorism Act was passed, it was more, it can, you know, send you to prison. I had to sue it before I get myself, you know, off the hook. So we are not saying that it is legitimate, huh? It is not at all. <laughs> then the other one about the British, um, you have to understand, there's a general belief, particularly in northern Nigeria among the Muslims, that this colonial inherited state that we have today, the concept of state in Nigeria, has failed us. And so people constantly see anyone linked to that state, particularly the Muslims, as someone who is a collaborator, who is not supporting us. Probably, if the state in Nigeria for the past 50 years has lived up to its expectations, providing real development to the people, empowering people, giving them good jobs, where really people can, you know, really live in good houses, they have good jobs, they don't need to take up guns and go and fight. And then you have also have to understand that in the age of the internet and social media, people are now listening and seeing what is happening around the world. And so there's this big narrative of the entire Western civilization being, being against Islamic civilization. That also reaches northern Nigeria. And don't expect that people will think that the British state is different from it. And so if you meet a typical Muslim, ordinary Muslim, probably who has not gone to school, on the streets of northern Nigeria, there's even no distinction between Christianity and Western civilization and the British Empire. They are all one and the same thing. So and I think that is why the grievances are still there. So some are considered collaborators, others not. Thank you. To, to, to add some more perspective to what um, Atanjo said, to, to take on um, Peter's question, there's, uh, and I, I think um, Bala also said um, some, something um, uh, similar as well about um, the ruling class in Northern Nigeria. The fact of the matter is the ruling class in Northern Nigeria have, always been considered to be collaborators with the British. It's always been that way. Now, in Northern Nigeria, there's a, there's a, as, as I mentioned in my, in, in my talk, there's a wide gap between the rich and the poor. The rich are the minority, and the poor make up the bulk of um, the, the common folk in, in Northern Nigeria. Uh, the, uh, and uh, just like Bala said, the, the ruling class, especially the rulers themselves, the, the, the emirs, the kings, are always thought of as having some kind of, um, uh, uh, um, as having a loyalty to some, to, to, to one particular group or the other. Or the other. So um, even in 2012, Boko Haram tried to kill the, the late emir of Kano, um, uh, mm -hmm. Adil Bayero, uh, who's a dead, who's, um, who's, who's dead now. And he was believed to be a member of the PDP, even though no one ever saw proof to, to say that he actually was. Uh, and one thing we also need to note about Boko Haram is, at its, uh, at, at its core, the, the sect is actually anti-status quo, and by um, being against the status quo, they're against the Saralta in northern Nigeria because they believe they're failed. Um, uh, uh, to take, uh, make a segue into um, the other question, which is about, um, uh, uh, okay, I think you also said something about um, a, 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 a possible role that the, the, the rulers can play in a post Reconstruction post uh, recon uh, reconciliation of Nigeria. You notice I never mentioned any um, um, possibility of the, 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 the ruling class playing such a role because they already lack that legitimacy with Boko Haram, first of all, and then with most of the common people anyway. Because um, as uh, the, the two gentlemen already sort of um, went into detail about, these guys already have a history of being known as collaborators with the British. 
uh, who were sinners, uh, as the, the guys who introduced uh, the monster of uh, Christianity and you know other corrosive, um, corrosive ideas and concepts into northern Nigeria. So I don't envisage that um, the, the ruling class playing such a role, which is why I, I focused uh, uh, entirely on the role of preachers, because most northern Muslims will tell you the first people they go to for information, and I asked many of them that um, question specifically, they, I, I said, where do you get the, 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 the bulk of your, the, the information you consider to be credible stuff from? And they said, it's primarily at the mosque. When we go to the mosque, if the imam says this or that or this or that, then we take it as you know, the truth wholesale. And then afterwards, maybe second, uh, on secondary basis, we'll maybe listen to the BBC house uh, or um, um, a radio service or something. And uh, yeah, so I think the preachers will have to play a primary role in that. Right. Can I just say something? I, I just got the and last bit. And the last bit. Discovered the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the PowerPoint. <laughs> you don't do this kind of field work without a sense of ingenuity. And he's, he's found a way around to, to get this. <laughs> I mean, regarding preachers, I mean, I, I think Izala, I mean, I think that's what Izala is trying to do. I mean, there's this, the, the whole goal of the introduction of, or the establishment of the Izala group is that people needed to be educated beyond what their preachers told them. And I think that's a problem, and that's the distinction between the Nizala group and the Tijania and Kadria groups. And that's why there's been such a, a kind of clash between them. Kanu is predominantly uh, Tijania or Kadria, one of the two. But in Joss and Kadumina and so on, people actually try to learn. They just don't take, like you said, wholesale what the preachers say anymore. They want to learn and understand exactly why he's interpreting what he's interpreting that way. And if they don't agree, then they challenge it. So there's, there's, so there's a lot of conflict between some of these sects there, and, and it's, it's actually pretty obvious. I mean, it's not as clear cut as, as you think. People just don't take the preachers, what they say, what they say, you know, just like that. The Zara group is, is doing a lot of work regarding changing the perception of how people interpret uh, religion or understand Islam in modern Nigeria. So I'll take one, one final round of questions, and then we'll, we'll come back to the speakers. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen here. Yeah. Just speak up a little bit, please. Yeah. So my name is Akinola Davis. I started an organization or a collective called Nigerian Life Matters. I'm from I'm a media curator. Um, my question to you was, uh, I've got a double question. I mean, thanks for putting it into context, because obviously it just shows how complex it is to run a country like Nigeria based on so many like varying issues. Um, but my first thing was, um, I guess the, the new government, their, their first thoughts is like accountability and security. But within that, how much do you think, or do you even think there's a possibility of incorporating both Islam and both moderate Islam and Christianity into like the into law, into legislation for those for maybe for specific regions or across uh, the country? And then my second question was, how important do you think it is for the global Nigerian diaspora? to come back into these areas and actually try and create industry if there is accountability and security put in place. Um, I'm Caroline, I'm a master's student here at SAS. I just want to preamble this because I was pretty ignorant about Boko Haram before I came. But going from what I know, like gender's been like a major lens that's put on Boko Haram in the media. So I was quite surprised that none of you mentioned gender when you were talking about Boko Haram. So I just wondered what role you think gender does play in the ideology of Boko Haram. And then if you're thinking about peace and reconciliation, what do you have to think about gender in order to challenge that? The gentleman just to your right, yeah. My name is Jabari Young. I'm a master's student in Cambridge, and I work at AFRICOM. My question is, it's about human security. I mean, it's, it's evident that a multidisciplinary approach is needed. Food, water, security, basic needs, these things need to be done. And I guess working uh, with Africom and the military, you realize that a military solution is not going to work. That is the faux pas. That's the great tragedy. So I guess my question is, how can Nigeria, with its ethno-religious differences and uh, various leadership challenges ahead, actually utilize the heart in his office to come together on some basic issues towards human security? And if anyone in the panelists would like to take that, I'd be happy. Great, thanks. I'll take a couple more questions. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, my question is to Atta. You, I mean, your your narrative seems to suggest that the root cause of Boko Haram is Islamic fun, fundamentalism. Of course, that's made legitimate by social, economic, and institutional failings. And you know, given your expansive work in northern Nigeria and on, and on Islam, I'm, I'm keen to ask what you think about the argument that is out there, which I mean, I mean, which sort of says that, it, that I mean, Islam needs sort of, a, sort of a reformation, the same kind that Christianity has gone through, you know, the Martin Luther Reformation in the 17th, in 16th century, and then, uh, you know, a lot of us say, a lot of us say that could be the, that could be the solution, but if you think that the uh, Islamic fun, fundamentalism would be a major cause of Boko Haram and, and all the, Insurgencies. Then I'm keen to know what your take on that is, because you know there are different sides of the argument. Richard Eaton and so as And the last question, back row. Right. Yep. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll start with Idi, we'll end with Bala, about a minute each to try to <laughs> pick your favourite question in that last round, pick, pick the easiest one, avoid the tough ones. Yes, I'm going to avoid the one about Islamic Reformation and then pick the one about women. <laughs> yeah, that's a real shame, I was hoping you would tackle it. Brilliant. Um, women. I, I mean, I, I, we, I don't think we were deliberately trying to, to overlook the, 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 the importance of women in all of this, um, the, the Boko Haram, what I like to call the, the, the Boko Haram madness. Women play a key role in the, continu the, the, the continuation of even, um, all of this. And the reason why the, the members of Boko Haram began abducting girls and women is because the men needed some motivation being out there living in, in the mountains and, and, and in the forest. So, of course, lots of women have, have been victimized and horrible things have been, despicable things have been done to them. And obviously, they're going to have to be at the part of the reconstruction and reconciliation that has to take place. So, um, but when, when, I mean, there's so, the myriad of things to talk about when you talk about Boko Haram and uh, even just having three hours or even five is, isn't enough to, to touch on all of these things. So we just try to be as a, as, as, um, as broad as possible by just sort of you know, looking at um, uh, um, reconstruction and reconciliation without touching specifically on women or children or men or any of that. But just to mention the ideology of Boko Haram regarding women, mm -hmm. there are all kinds of arguments from the Quran. People who think it's political, others who think it's scripturally based in the Quran, others who think it is manipulation of the Quranic scripture, you know. But Boko Haram follows the radical Salafi kind of ideology, where the role of the woman is seen because of her features being different from that of the man. 
So her role in the family, in the society, in the community is totally different. She's not supposed to show her face. She's not supposed to be seen with somebody. You know, it's very, very conservative. And so if that happens to a Muslim woman, imagine a Christian woman who is captured by Boko Haram and recognized her as a spoil of war. That's going to be different. That's why you hear Sheikau talking about selling them in the market, you know, except she converts or she becomes a Muslim and that kind of thing. Just to mention the ideology briefly. It's not as if we don't want to talk about it, but we can't talk about everything. Just as soon as we must come, sorry. Yes. So the issue of the reformation, he mentioned, it's not as if the ideology, the fundamentalism is really the main cause. I think that Islamic sects, they have a lot of intra kind of rivalry and quarrels and influence within Islamic sects in northern Nigeria. That is very true. But as he mentioned, the reformation cannot come from outside. It has to come from within Islam. Islamic scholars, the moderate voices and others. And I lived in Egypt for two years. My experience in Egypt is that there's a bit of generational war between the older generation and much more younger people who want to be progressive, who really want to be much more educated. Now, when this older generation gradually goes up, I don't know what the younger generation will do. If that kind of information will come with them, I'm not the one to say. But I think that there will be some kind of natural progression which happens with the entire humanity, not just Islam, not just Christianity, not just Buddhism. I think the whole of humanity is changing and it will continue to change. If Islam changes, I'm not to say. If it doesn't, I don't know what will happen. I think that's what I have to say. Yeah. So, Mr. Richard, your question was on um, moderate, I'm, I'm trying to put legal, legal uh, to legalize the Sharia. Yeah? No, 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 not legalize Sharia, but find moderate. I'm, I'm not sure if people think, if most Muslims, I don't think they think there's anything like moderate Islam. I think they just think it's Islam. I mean, you know, it's just the way it is. You know, it's either you are a Muslim and you are following these, the Quran and the Sunnah, or you are not following it. It's not a matter of being a moderate or fundamentalist or whatever. You know, it's just very straightforward. And some of these laws are already incorporated in the Sharia law, and, and, and uh, especially in most northern states. So people already live within Sharia. I mean, the thing about Sharia in 1999 is that it was not introduced, it was expanded. I mean, and the expansion was with the criminal aspect of it. And <coughs> that's what brought up all the crisis, because it already existed even before independence. It was already incorporated into the laws of the country, so it was something that was already there. Just that it was made, it was politically, it was, there was so much fanfare and, fanfare, and then they, made, they brought the criminal aspect of it and cut off somebody's hand and said they were going to kill a woman who, had, who got pregnant out of wedlock. So it's not, it's always existed, you know. And gender, yes, we, we, the whole idea of Boko Haram and the whole global take on Boko Haram is because 200 girls were, were, were abducted in, 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 in um, Shibok. And before then, there had been daily abductions of girls and boys and women, you know? And so it's, it was nothing new, it just brought it to the fore. I mean, uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, I've written a lot of reports saying that there's a huge humanitarian crisis regarding this, you know? And unfortunately, most of these women that are abducted, most of them, their husbands have already been killed. You know, so it's not, we're not, we're not underplaying the, the, the impact that Boko Haram has had on women and and, but it's, you know, it's something that we, it's something that we discussed so much, I thought, I, for me personally, I just thought it wasn't something that I would bring up now, I didn't want to talk about cheap work and bring back our girls and all that. So, the, the comment was about women impacting reconciliation rather than the other way around? Yeah, women would, yeah, they, they might have an impact. I, Let me just, just give her, if you mm -hmm. look at the video at the beginning, we are running a massive program, both in Yola and Medukri. You can see that nun from Ireland, she's a woman. Most of those who are in the school, and they have been trained, on really not how to, only how to take care of the orphans, but really how to engage and improve. And I think that in a society like Nigeria, it's really going to take time. It's not going to be something sudden. At the moment, people are trying to recover from the shock. But I think gradually, these things will happen. And I want to mention briefly is the issue of human security. Human security and what Buhari can do. This is my personal opinion. At the moment, we have a lot of what I call non-Boko Haram violent conflicts going on around, particularly in the Middle East. And this is related to the environment. 
If you go to the northeast, particularly northern part of Nigeria, there's a lot of desertification. Mm -hmm. Substantial number of the subsistence farmers depend on the land because they don't have government jobs. And because of desertification and lack of rain, they can no longer rely on the land. So what happens? They are migrating to the Middle Belt region, which is much more fertile, so that they can settle. But the problem in Nigeria is about ethnicity, indigents and settlers. You guys arriving, you are Nigerian citizens, but you are settlers. We are indigents. We are the owners of this land. We can't accept you here. As I talk to you, the serious crisis ongoing in Taraba, which is almost worse than Boko Haram. Nobody talks about it. So I think what Buhari can do, maybe, is to get rid of this indigent settler thing from the north. Can't. It's something that doesn't I'm happen. saying maybe, but yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he can't go away. He can't go away. He he can't go away even, even, from his, even from his film, one, one thing I took away from the, from the short film is that everybody was described based on his ethnicity. An evil man helped us. I, you know, everybody was a Muslim man because it's something that's inbred. I mean, ethnicity and religion, identities in Nigeria are so important. I mean, we might talk about getting rid of it, but deep down the back of our minds, the first thing every Nigerian asks when he meets another Nigerian is, where are you from? Okay, That's you can see. Question. So, Buhari has to you know, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, very much. So, on, on, on that, from <laughs> after the night, I can see people putting hands up. And if you've got more questions, I would encourage you to have a chat to the, the speakers afterwards. Um, just as a, a final note of thanks to, to all of you for coming out. What, one of the real privileges I have to say of, of working at SOAS is getting to work with, uh, with PhD students like, like uh, Ini, Bakindo and, and Bala. Um, everything I know about Boko Haram I've learned from these guys, so I have a, a, a huge debt of gratitude uh, to, to, to them. So thank you to, the, to, to you for